I tried to think of a nice top, a nice title, but uh, really, this is the thrust of of what we're going to talk about today. Researchers think that practitioners don't know anything and therefore don't use our wonderful research. And um, practitioners frequently feel that uh, researchers are solving problems that may not realistically be what their, what their real problems are. So today's panel, every panel member has both worked as a practitioner and as a researcher. So each of us have walked in both kinds of shoes. And what I'd like to do is to begin by each person introducing themselves and giving you a picture of what our uh, background and perhaps where we're coming from, and then we'll talk about a few different questions. I welcome questions from the audience. I welcome uh, people to jump at in. Let me begin by saying I'm Elaine Wayuker. Um, after I graduated from college, I worked as a programmer, and then I went to graduate school and got a master's degree in computer science and get a, got a job working for IBM as a systems engineer. Uh, I then went back and got a PhD and spent the first half of my post-PhD career as a professor and researcher at New York University, which is a major American uh, research institution. And after uh, 18 years and I was a tenured full professor, I had this epiphany, which is I'm doing software engineering with no software. Wow, is that stupid. And so at that point, I resigned and moved to what was first AT&T Bell Labs and then uh, later AT&T Labs and spent the next 18 years uh, working in industry. Uh, in the, I was in the research division, but always working with uh, projects. So, the next person is Sigrid, who is the co-moderator. Yes. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sigrid Eld, and I work at Ericsson now and have done for 24 years, actually had working life before that. I'm very sorry, I got a, a mutant bug, so I'm a bit sick. So I will not be speaking so much as I usually do. Um, I actually had a whole work life from all kinds, programming, testing, manager within different companies, um, until I actually became such a smart ass and said, I want also to have a PhD proving how good I am. So that came very late in my life. And actually, Westeros here in Mälardalen is my alma mater. Um, I have continued and sort of I work in a research unit at Ericsson. So now I'm sort of one off Dilbert style, you know, from the real, but I work together with the testers around the Ericsson. Um, the key, I think, is I see a lot of academics coming. They really want data. And then we often sit in industry and wonder, OK, so we gave you the data. You did something. You got your paper. But we really want to be able to solve our problems. So I think um, a lot of my PhD students and so on, so I'm an adjunct professor at Carlton now, uh, we have really sort of learned that if you come from industry and trying to solve industry problems together with academia, that is when things are really happening. So that's where I come from. I oh, and I have to add one more thing. My claim to fame is I was the opponent on Sigrid's uh, defense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
So, which end should we start from? The grand old man other than us of uh, the panel. Do you want to, do you want to, to introduce, introduce you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, most people here know me, I guess. I'm uh, Lionel Brion, and I, I work for a center at the University of Luxembourg of 300 people. The center has about 38 industry partners. And our mandate is to run collaborative research projects with industry. And we work with the automotive industry, the satellite industry, and the financial industry among the main domains uh, of activity. And I, uh, I do both research, I publish, and at the same time, uh, I try to solve uh, actual engineering problems in an applicable and scalable way. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Per Erik Strandberg. Please call me Per. I'm one of the locals. I live here in Westeros. Uh, back when I was young and beautiful, I got a master's in mathematics and then another math master in uh, bioinformatics. I started working and uh, when I was a consultant uh, for five years, I uh, led a competence network at this uh, consultancy company. Uh, then I started working at Westemo and uh, now I am an industrial doctoral student at Westemo. I'm on my second year. So um, I'm doing research at Westemo, getting paid by Westemo, but I'm also at Maladolin University. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Marcus Boy. I'm with uh, RISE 6 in uh, Lund, Sweden, the south of Sweden. I'm also an uh, adjunct uh, senior lecturer with Lund University. I started my engineering career as a developer with uh, ABB in, uh, in Malmö in Sweden, and. Uh, I worked then as a developer doing uh, editors and compilers in the process automation domain. So a lot of heavy processes there, safety critical work, uh, documentation, documentation, and testing, quite a lot of software testing as well. So my software testing background uh, uh, as a practitioner was of course development centered. I did my unit tests for my code. Uh, I had code coverage targets to reach and I also spent a lot of time writing test specifications on a component level, uh, really stepwise instructions for how, uh, how uh, humans should manually uh, test, test components, uh, pulling cables and clicking buttons and the like. Uh, then ABB downsized and I uh, uh, entered a period of uh, leave of absence to do a PhD with Lund University. And uh, one of the first things I did was to attend a summer school on software testing. Uh, that was in, uh, in Graz, in Austria, and it was organized, among others, by Gordon Fraser. Uh, I've seen him here around. Uh, so that was really something totally different, uh, mind-blowing. Uh, all those uh, mutation testing, search-based testing, model-based testing. I mean, to me, before that, testing was really this tedious, super boring thing, where you brought in loads of uh, consultants just to get the manpower and the person hours to, to complete the tests before, uh, before releasing a product. So that was really my first uh, experience of this gap between the research front and, uh, and the industry. Uh, now I'm with uh, RISE 6 since 2015 and trying to work, uh, that's an institute trying to bridge academia and, uh, and, uh, and um, industry and uh, working on knowledge transfer. Um, and uh, now I'm still active in software testing and I'm happy to be here. Hello, my name is Christian Wiklund. I work at Ericsson here in Sweden. And um, I've always known that I would do research. At first I thought it was medicine, then I realized that people are sticky inside <laughs> and decided to go into comput computer science instead. Uh, I worked at Ericsson for about 18 years now, seven, 15, 16, 17, working with test tool development. First hacking test tools, then test strategies. Um, Tried to be a line manager for a while, didn't do that. Last few years, project manager for a reasonably big system. And uh, now I'm a strategic product manager for a large part of Ericsson's test environments. Uh, I also did research here in Westeros and uh, uh, defended my thesis three years ago, I think, uh, on quite soft things. 
So what happens when we're using test automation in reality? So I'm a very soft person when it comes to, to my research and uh, effects and behaviors and stuff like that. Okay, so as you can see, we have a variety of, of backgrounds and, and a range of experience. Um, I came across this, this quote, and it's very interesting who the quote is from. It's probably not somebody you would guess. It's from Einstein. And I found it very, very interesting that, uh, they, that he felt that engineers were the ones who create what had never been. And so I asked the panelists to think about this a little bit and uh, how it might relate to us. And in conjunction with that, I asked them also to think about the fact that software testing research uh, generally falls into the field of software engineering and what are the implications of this and um, to what extent do software engineering, do software testing researchers behave as engineers? So, anybody want to start by tackling that? I gave you all weeks of time to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we need to be both because what we are doing is engineering research. So, uh, yes, we need to devise applicable and scalable solutions to relevant engineering problems. But our research needs to be scientific, scientifically grounded or grounded into the scientific method. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the research problems we tackle and the way we devise solutions uh, has to be informed by engineering knowledge and engineering know-how. So. Yeah, I can, uh, I can only look at myself. And, uh, so in uh, 2015, I implemented a test prioritization and selection system. And uh, when I had done it, I realized, oh shit, there's 40 years of research done already. Why, <laughs> didn't, I, why didn't I read those papers? Uh, so, so this ties into the problem uh, where you said that people in industry are not adopting these uh, research results. Uh, I also think I have personal experience of the other way around, where, where industry are solving these problems uh, that, I don't know if they're impossible, but that academia is not looking at. So I, I have a paper in submission where we try to run the same test case in, in different ways on the test system to get uh, some good coverage. And for, from uh, what I understand, uh, there isn't research on this very practical problem that is a problem to me in the industry and to many others. So I, um, I think I have ex personal experience of both of these worlds. Yeah. And I, I hope to bridge it to some extent now that I you know, have my foot in both worlds. Okay. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, I recognize this sort of would never work in theory thing. And uh, one thing that we get uh, quite a lot now when start, trying to start up the um, uh, test mod project is, okay, but this is already solved my colleagues say. And I try to explain that, well, it's not really solved. We just think it's solved. It works here in our context, sort of. And, and that is, I think, the, the missing part here. We as engineers think that, okay, I solved my problem here. It works now, but it might not work in your context or, or somewhere else. And that's where science is important. But then we, we are sometimes thinking that, okay, yeah, we're so good, so we don't need science because that's your only overhead, right? <laughs> So, so we never get to that part where we uh, look on the wider effects of it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, for me personally, I think this is a, a very interesting question and it kind of has to do my, my own uh, personal identity because uh, um, the thing is I have two employers. I'm employed by uh, the Swedish Institute of Computer Science and I'm employed by Lund University Department of Computer Science. So I already have computer science twice uh, in my in my uh, title, kind of. And uh, 
I would much rather see that being something related to software because I'm not doing computer science. I really like computer science. Uh, that was my main topic when I did my masters and both my older brothers are actually pure computer scientists. They haven't done any engineering, but I really know what it means and I, I appreciate it. But um, to me, uh, engineering is, is something else and that's what I try to do at least. But of course, it's not that clear cut. And uh, I mean, you can be in, uh, a fundamental researcher really in Lund, for example, we now have this work on a new particle accelerator, and uh, if you work as a scientist there and you suddenly have to do some work on a metal plate somewhere to get better readings, that's very engineering-ish. And uh, on the other hand, if you're a chemi chemical engineer over uh, trying to understand some process, you might want to understand how something works on a molecule level to optimize it. I mean, then that's very science-y work. So, uh, I think it's good that the same individual can swing a bit back and forth. I think that should be encouraged much more. Um, okay, so I have a question for the audience. How many of you are academics? Hand up. Okay, how many of you have done paper together with industry? Okay, and how, keep your hand up. How many of you have come back afterwards and checked that what you did is still working? Or is being used? Is being used. Okay. <laughs> Both. Otherwise, you wouldn't know, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, it, yeah. You have to be logical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. good. So the the issue is, you know, to what extent has the research that you did collaboratively? Yeah collaboratively with industry actually made its way into the practice? Yes. You yes, are absolutely. absolutely As I said, I'd yeah. love questions. But I'd love. Yeah, I, I really would like to question that. I mean, it's when you say that you're painting that picture that, oh, it's the onus is on scientists to be really to make sure it works and so on. I, I, I see many times when it's not lo no longer works, that for like political reasons in the company and things that are totally out of science's, scientist control. So I think it's much more gray this, uh, than just painting the picture that scientists should work in a different way. I, I you know, I, uh, I, I agree. Uh, I okay. like to, to actually agree with, with Robert here and um, Sometimes it gets into, or most of the time, things go into beauty contest, right? So someone likes their solution a lot, and there comes a scientist and come with something else. Scientist leaves, the other person stays. Who will win? The person that stays, of course. I, I also uh, agree with uh, Robert. There are many reasons why sometimes solutions don't get used. And it may have nothing to do with whether or not they bring benefits. We know how the corporate world works, you know. So, uh, but there are many ways in which such collaborations can bring benefits. It's not just that you're going to bring a solution that is going to be deployed. I think there is value just in the interaction to start with. Just talking to each other, exchanging information, exchanging ideas, exchanging viewpoints. I think there is just value there just to start with. And then, even if a solution never gets de uh, deployed in a company, the fact that as an academic, by being informed about industrial practice, you make your research more relevant, you make your solutions more applicable, maybe not for that company, maybe for someone else down the road, is also a benefit. So there are many ways in which those collaborations bring benefits, even if the solution you devised is not right away deployed and applied uh, you know, in your partner's company. Okay. But, but what would the, the incentive be for the company to enter such a collaboration? Uh, well, uh, I think, as I, as I said, the first type of benefits you can observe is the exchange of information and ideas. For example, you said that you developed a solution for regression test selection and you were not aware of the literature. 
Well, if you had started to collaborate with an academic, uh, you know, in the area of testing, he would have not only told you about the research, but he would have pointed to you the most interesting papers or the potentially more useful. That doesn't mean they would have been useful. That means you would have been informed. And on his side, of course, he would, all, he would have also benefited because he would have had your perspective in terms of what is the problem, how you define it, what are the working assumptions, you know. So okay. there are many. Uh, so uh, let me break in yes. and say something. Um, I agree with the issue that you brought up. I agree to some, I get to talk too. <laughs> um, I agree with some of your points, but so many of the papers, which may have really interesting ideas, have not been shown to work at scale. And therefore, and therefore, and therefore, even if the practitioner is familiar with this research, they look at it and they say, I can't use this. And so, so that is, it's, you know, you said, if you would talk to researchers, they would have told you the, the solution. No, and I the answer, uh, they would have told you the most. I, didn't say that. I said you would be informed, and then you can make a choice. Okay. But I would be informed. Okay. That's okay. So. I want to jump in there because. When, my question, maybe you started this now, but I think isn't the problem of universities not teaching testing clearly? I mean, maybe this is a question to all you in the universities. Yes, that triggers some. So. Thank you, Andy. Andy Pogorski. I'd like to address that question by uh, conducting a scientific survey of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'd like to ask a question and have each panel member an answer it briefly, but I want them to promise that they'll, they'll think up their answer and then they'll stick with it no matter what the other panel members say. So you won't influence one another. Okay, you ready? We're ready. What is the purpose of software testing? What is the focus of no, no. purpose? The purpose. purpose. The reason I ask is I, I think that might highlight some of the issues between industry and um, academia. Thank you. That's a good one. Yeah, I, I know my answer. So I know mine, but you can start. Huh? Yeah, that's what let's start. <laughs> so uh, for me, testing has many purposes. The most important one is feedback. Um, Sometimes it can be, you know, feedback on, yes, we have implemented the requirement, it works as specified. Sometimes it's something else, uh, but feedback is the most important for me. Yeah, I can go. You can go next. Um, <coughs> sorry. I want to know if I can release the software. That's it. Okay. We were misbehaving. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> misbehaving. So, yeah, I think this is interesting. This is also a bit related to the, the question there. What, what do we as test engineers create? Because engineers typically create something that helps humanity. And I think t test engineers create uh, evidence that uh, is used to build evidence, that is used to build an argumentation that the system works as intended. That's testing to me. Uh, well, you know, I guess what I'm going to say is not very original, but I see two uh, broad categories, I mean, two broad objectives for testing. You know, one is verification, that is bug finding, and the other one is validation, that is gaining confidence into the dependability of the system. And usually the techniques are not the same to achieve those two objectives. Uh, and actually that's one of the difficulties in practice. Uh, who hasn't expressed an opinion? You? Well, Sigrid? Uh, yeah, you go she ahead. She has a microphone. Well, I don't need the microphone. I've got a microphone. We're done. Okay. We're done. All have said their I thing. Know. You okay. said also something. Well, I guess I guess basically I I agree with uh, with uh, Lionel that it both it's useful for finding what I couldn't agree with him. Yeah, <laughs> Lionel and I almost never agree. So no, actually, Lionel and I. Above, ab agree far too often. <laughs> okay, I help you out. 
For me, it's measuring the quality we have. It's a pure measurement. And then you have to decide if that measurement is good enough or not good enough for release decision, testing more, etc. It's a sample, and that should be based, you think, on some scientific, but I think it's gut feeling more than how much proof you have. So this is what I want to change. I'd like to, sorry for asking a question now that I'm in the panel, but you said measure and you said quality. And is that what you do when you do testing? I, I know that a lot of people say we do testing because it can show quality. Uh, but also, so, so this is a very interesting for me because there are like a million definitions of quality out there. Whenever, and whenever someone says quality, I get really triggered because I don't even know what, what, what it could mean. Uh, and you also said measure. So you maybe need a better course at university on quality. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. No, I have like five definitions that I go back to every now and then. But it's so the some same as testing, right? Ah, but some people say process quality. So did you follow the V model? Then you have quality. Some say, oh, it's user experience. Then you have quality. And then there are some others. It's like measuring love. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? It's like measuring he love. He said measuring <laughs> love. Yeah, <laughs> But uh, I have a quite simple definition of software quality. If it makes me angry, then it's of low quality. If it doesn't make me angry, then it's okay. It's like love. Speaking as a practitioner, I think you have all failed to answer your question. No. No, I don't think so. No, I said feedback. And for. Okay, so whatever yeah. else. So, so you have a better answer? Obviously. Testing's purpose is to provide information. What? I'm sorry. Uh, you missed it. You weren't paying attention. Testing's purpose is to provide information. All the things you outlined, every one of you, was some form of inter information. And I agree with the question because I think fundamentally, in our going back to education system, we have failed to provide the necessary information to both practitioners and academics. And so we end up in a large disconnect that I think I heard first from you, Elaine, about 30 years ago, uh, if not, not longer. And, yes. and so I think we're maybe answering the wrong questions and maybe not even asking the right question. Yeah, so. So the. the okay, yeah. Do you want to. Uh, and. So my purpose was to find out what you thought. And I thought I heard basically three different answers. Well. There's measurement, feedback. Feedback might be measurement. It might be something slightly different. And then there was, uh, I'm release, paraphrasing, assessment. Release the software. Assessment and bug finding. So assessment. Uh, may be the same as measurement. Bug finding is different. So I detect a substantial disagreement in the panel about the purpose of software testing. Okay, and, and let me just say, I said we don't all necessarily agree, but what we all have done is walked in both the shoes of a practitioner and the shoes of a, of a researcher. And therefore, we all have, based on our experience, have come away with some kind of picture of what life is like. And let me, let me say, here's one of the radical suggestions I have made. Almost, it is very rare for software engineering academics to have themselves engineered some real software. So most of the education that we're giving our students is telling them how we imagine software is engineered. And when I've said this to people, their answer was the point of a university is not to be a trade school. We are not but the point of a university is to educate people 
so that they are prepared to do things. And to what extent do people think that the education we're giving and the, what, what Sigrid brought up, the fact that uh, most people graduate with degrees in either computer science or software engineering without a course in software testing. It's something that lower level beings do. It's not something that uh, you know, professionals do. And what, to what extent are we, when we are academics, missing the boat in the way we're uh, teaching people to be uh, software engineers and software testers in particular? And, uh, and to what extent are we doing a good job? And I'd, I'd like to hear from practitioners uh, to what extent do the people who come out of the university and go to work for you come prepared to do that work? And from academics, I'd like to hear to what extent do you think I'm being unfair? And remember, I've been both. But, <clears throat> sorry, I think that uh, the situation is much better now than 20 years ago. It is. If I look at the, uh, the people that are younger than 35 at least uh, at work, they are doing, they have at least have intent to do TDD unit testing, et cetera, et cetera, which we would have said 20 years ago, okay, yes, that was a good idea, but let's not do that because it takes time from coding, to be quite honest. So I think it's a lot better now. And I don't know if that's university or if it's YouTube or if it's something else, but something has definitely changed to the better. Agile. No, agile is just a process, uh, a product <laughs> management method, so it's... Uh, well, I think agile. it also may be a function of where you are. So, education in different places. In, yes. Then I would say that Iran is the country that's most successful, because most of my colleagues are actually from Iran. From what? Iran. Iran, Iraq. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, no, I, and think, uh, I think were we're educated think, yeah. in Iran and Iraq? Yeah, I would say so, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, and not uh, in the US. Okay. We don't have that many Americans, no. Chinese. No, 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 no. I'm saying yeah. that's, you know, I'd say products of US universities are generally not trained in that way. I think even if you do uh, unit testing and uh, those kinds of things, I think it's uh, very common to have the sort of developer uh, happy path testing kind of mentality. I think uh, also that the role of the tester is um, it's uh, sort of threatened because I think many people who are working with testing test frameworks or whatever, they are actually software developers. They are these positive people trying to build stuff and I'm this destructive guy, I want to tear it down. I want to poke the knife into the back of every software I can find to, to see it break. And uh, that not only makes me a psycho, but it sort of makes me a tester. <laughs> and I think a lot of people who are developers, uh, sorry, even a lot of people who are testers have this developer mentality. Yes, but you could present the job of a tester in a more positive way as well. No, no, no this no. is positive. Let me finish. I think what I hope is that in the future, the job of test engineers will be uh, the job of test automation engineers. And that increasingly, test engineers will have the responsibility to automate testing. And effectively automating testing, by automating testing, I don't mean automating test execution only. That's what I mean. I mean automating test generation, failure detection, fault localization, you know. And if the job of the test engineer become the job of a test automation engineer, then from an engineering standpoint, the task will be as interesting and as complex mm. as a job of a typical you know, developer. Mm -hmm. you know. So, and uh, that's where I hope we are going because you know, we cannot keep going with the complexity of the yeah. systems we are dealing with and that which is increasing as well. We cannot keep going by having people manually testing or mostly manually testing. So at some point, the profession has to change. You know, yeah, and that's yeah. what I hope will happen. Yeah. 
no. and that would of course also uh, increase the status a lot of the of yes. the entire testing workforce exactly. so that would be very very important yeah. i like the mentality thing you said before and <laughs> i would like to ask a follow up question before we lose that thread so uh, did you have this mentality already before your university studies or was that something you achieved <laughs> I, through I, the i uh, think i got it because i'm a mathematician uh, uh, that was my first uh, degree so, so i i uh, that made me not. Not. I don't think all mathematicians are psycho, but it gives you an attention to detail. I think, <laughs> and I think this attention to detail, uh, in some way, made me a good tester. But I'd like to follow up on what you said of of presenting the job of a tester in a more positive way. Mm. I think you're right, and I think I did a very bad job at, at presenting <laughs> why I'm a good tester. And I think this uh, sort of division or or wall between testers and developers. I think uh, maybe I did a mistake here saying what I said. So well, I have to agree with your original thing because the, what attracted me to testing. Well, yeah, I I, I have to say, it, not only was my first degree in mathematics, my my PhD dissertation was not only mathematics, but the far end of, I did undecidability results. So testing always appealed to me uh, because of the negativity, because of the stabbing, because of it's like a mystery. And I gave a talk to the uh, practitioner uh, meeting that was on uh, Monday, and it was called I Know Where You're Hiding. And they were expecting some kind of stalker movie, I think, but instead it was about uh, doing software fault prediction. There's a, I think there was a question back there. Yeah. Daniel, are you going to? Oh, thank you. Um, are we invisible from there? Because I've been holding my hand up for a long time. Uh, so I think this is a very interesting discussion, but I would like to bring the panel back to the topic at hand. You talked about developers versus testers. I think that's a great discussion, not the topic of this panel. And then we talked about teaching testing and how we teach testing. We're really talking about testing research versus practice, right? I mean, where the research is happening can be in a company or in a university setting. So I don't know if the topic of academics is really that important to this panel discussion. So, uh, but anyway, let me ask, let me uh, tell you a few things about uh, my experience so I've, I've been doing research in a university for a while, uh, 15 or 16 years, and we did lots of interesting work on model-based testing and test generation. Um, then I, um, and I met practitioners who are doing really interesting things in, in their work. So both fields, both uh, kinds of uh, folks, researchers and testers, pra practitioners, are doing interesting things on their own, and what I'd like to bring to the conversation is if they interact, then their work gets even more exciting. So I can give you an example where um, when I went to Google for a, a sabbatical, I was exposed to the kinds of problems that they were having. So my research got better and uh, I had that experience firsthand. So, and I changed directions in my research to that, uh, so that I was doing research that was more relevant. And I have as proof of that uh, my manager from Google sitting right next to me, uh, and he can tell you that he has been a practitioner for so many years, and because he got exposed to the research that I did there, maybe some of his perspectives changed and the way he's doing things changed. So I'd like to invite him to say a few words about how that experience helped. Well, I mean, uh, prior to uh, Atif and before him, Sebastian, uh, working with my group to really do research that was very relevant to our problems, uh, we really hadn't made good progress on solving some of these really high value problems. We're spending millions of dollars running tests in our compute lab, and uh, some of the optimization techniques, some of the research that we did with Atif uh, has already saved us millions of dollars uh, and is super important to, to us. And I, I think I've gotten way more interested in collaboration with academics since, and I've sponsored more interns and uh, got more grad students working with more professors. Um, it's really been highly valuable for my group. Uh, in fact, now I have uh, 
four or five ex-researchers now working in my group because I gathered them in from the corners of Google where they were uh, not very happy and uh, they're, they're very glad to be able to do some research in my group. So I'm, I think it's been a, a very transformative thing from both sides. My response very quickly is large companies have this possibility. But as you know, we had the SAST meeting. I created that organization in 94, and it's several thousand members, and they have not got this epiphany yet. They listened. I heard some say it was fantastic. It was arranged together, but I don't think 250 of those people are here. <clears throat> And this is the problem. It's still such a gap on the floor. So I, I congratulate you. <clears throat> I think you have real problems. Uh, that can be solved. And I also see this machine learning. So that's back to the panel. So do you think that this new fault localization, machine learning, and so on, will the tester research? That, all that knowledge comes from academia, I would say. And it's, I think, transforming business today. So, do you have any comment on how that, how you see that future? Do you have a vision on that? Well, let me just change yeah. that drop. Yeah. I would not say necessarily comes from academia, it comes from research organizations, yeah, yeah, right. because there's also, there I is agree. industrial research. Sorry. I'll take the opportunity to return to the discussion with you had with Robert here, actually. <laughs> you, you mean you thought about we went it for into nothing? The detour. <laughs> and then it goes to what I would expect when I have a researcher in my organization. And that's actually quite little, to be, to be fully truthful. Because I, I don't expect the researchers to come in and save the day. I expect my engineers to come in and save the day. But I expect my engineers to learn something from the researcher. And that we can learn, it can be a, a failure, and we know that there are no failures as long as we do good research, because we always learn something, then we embrace that. Or it could be a prototype tool. And to maintain that, to handle that, to manage that, takes engineering and not a single PhD student. So what we are missing when we are sort of failing to take care of the research is not that we are failing to take care of the tool that the research gave us. We don't have a plan how to move this tool into production. And that is quite common actually for all sorts of test tools because someone gets a good idea, they hack it together, slap it to, and suddenly we have something mission critical that nobody knows how to handle. And in that sense, it's good that we didn't take in the super complex research tool. But we, we need, as an industry, to think, okay, why is the, the research there? We are there because you want to get the paper, probably, and learn something further the knowledge of mankind. Choose your own reasons. I want to learn something about my system, and I want to have a learning experience from my engineers who can develop this into something tangible with the good benefit for me. There's a... Yeah, what's the question? Where, where, what are we discussing now? I don't know. Somebody wanted to ask a question. No? no? I, I'd like to ask a, a question of the panel, and um, it's this. Uh, I think the uh, barrier for many practitioners of using research is that the cost of entry is too high, unless you have been uh, exposed to kind of the somewhat esoteric language of uh, research publications. Uh, and even if you have uh, it, it, the, the uh, amount of effort that it takes to kind of mine a nugget uh, of applicable information out of that can be substantial. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for practitioners uh, trying to apply research, there are so many kind of practical uh, issues that burn time and energy uh, in just getting to a, a fairly small uh, inch pebble, if you will, in applying a, a more abstract concept, uh, there's a barrier there as well. So I wonder you know, what your observations might be on trying to reduce barriers on both sides uh, such that there might be a, a more easy uh, collaboration. So I guess I can start this time. Uh, Communication, I guess, is the first thing. Uh, is try to start talking to industry practitioners, where meet them where they are. That's for me, as a research institute researcher, very, very fundamental. Collaboration on common challenges, that's really important. And of course, the onboarding. You have to be very gentle when you introduce practitioners for the first time to the research uh, uh, process because it's, it's, quite, it's quite different. But uh, yeah, communicate as much. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd also like to hook into this uh, scientific publication. So if I'm a typical practitioner and I have a problem, I don't go to Google Scholar. I go to uh, Stack Overflow or to Wikipedia. And I once met uh, this researcher, uh, he was doing uh, some farming research or something, and he said, whenever we have a, a result, we put it in Wikipedia. So that was their communication with the general public. And uh, that made me think, really. So uh, reading a scientific paper, you know, to, to many people, that's, uh, they just don't. It's not worth it. Uh, for me, as you know, I've been doing it for two years, maybe I read the abstract at least, and if I get curious, I continue reading. So I think, um, I'm not saying that everyone should package the research on Wikipedia, but I think it's a good idea to think about it. So uh, if we make some uh, publications on test selection perhaps, why don't we look at the Wikipedia page and try to, to make it uh, accessible? And that way, we, you have your reference at the bottom or whatever, and you get your cita citation, everyone's happy. So I think really it's the responsibility of academia to, to uh, get the research out there oh, well, and package it in, in a way that's consumable. So, okay, uh, okay. Yeah, you go uh, and then I'll it's go. It's an important question actually. Yeah, uh, I want to answer his and, question. And uh, I don't think Wikipedia is going to do it, uh, to be honest. Uh, you can convey generalities and high-level principles of Wikipedia, but that's not going to help people apply what you have done or tailor it. Well, it's going to go 10% of the way. <laughs> but uh, papers are a means, and perhaps an obsolete means, of communication between scientists. They are not designed, or scientific papers are not designed to communicate with practitioners. That's not why they are written. Let me finish. That's not how they are not written to be such an instrument. Yeah. So they are written to be assessed, peer reviewed by other scientists in order to determine whether or not the research that is reported is valid. That's all they are. Now, if you want to transfer research results, there is the best way to do it. There are many ways, but the best way to do it is to do collaborative research. You know, collaborative research between industry and, uh, and research groups. And for this to happen, the scientific funding agencies need to support collaborative research. They do in Sweden. They don't do it that well in all countries. Uh, in Sweden, I know you are pretty good at it, but that's not, you cannot generalize that to all countries. Uh, and collaborative research is having people to work together, to interact, to talk to each other. To work together on common problems is the only way, along with graduating students who are going to work for your partner, which is another way also to transfer knowledge. This is the only way you're going to transfer that type of research knowledge. I yeah. want to say something else, okay? I get to say something. Um, my experience is that researchers frequently don't understand what the requirements of practitioners are, that they don't have the luxury of trying something that may not scale, it may sound like a good idea, and unless if we can go and provide empirical evidence that something works at the scale and in an environment that sounds like uh, the world that the practitioner lives in, I think in general, they're not going to read, they're not going to read the papers, they're not going to be interested. So the only way that we got buy-in is by coming with the first system that we had applied it for, to, showing that here we use this technique on a half a million lines of code. It looks like this. It sounds like this. This is what we found. Does this sound like, like what you want? And, uh, and that's the way we got buy-in. And the first one is tough to get. It takes a lot of time for the fault prediction work we did. The first paper that we wrote was two years after we wor started working on it because the data collection, the mistakes, the getting people on board, etc. It's a lot of overhead, but that's what you need. I could, 
you know, I was somebody who was a theoretician. I could turn out a paper full of proofs that would be published in no time at all. When I moved to doing uh, software engineering and software testing research, if you can't provide evidence that's going to resonate with practitioners, it's not going to be adopted. And I think that's the bottom line. I think uh, that looks like... Yeah, I think that that's one of the uh, core issue of the relationship between industry and academia. And because even if I, I engage with industry and I point my partners to some papers, academic papers, that's not what they are looking for. Absolutely. What, what they are looking for is, first of all, is there any evidence that what I'm talking about may have a chance to work in their environment? And in many cases, I don't have the evidence I can find in uh, academic papers to answer adequately to that question. And what they also would like to have is not a prototype tool. It's something that can be automated, automated testing, some kind of automation. And, and as academic, I don't have the resources to provide that level of uh, tooling. And going also back to the, and it's all tied together because the funding agency in my country, they fund very expensive equipment, but they do not fund the development of adequate tools in software. Absolutely. It's um, all, all, all this is tied together. And when I'm in front of my students, and I have a testing <laughs> course, when I'm in front of the students, I try my best to tell them, look, I am talking about this testing technique because I can show to you some evidence. If, as, as an instructor, if I don't have the evidence, what can I teach to my students? Thank you. I agree. I, I, you know, I agree with you. And the American model is very much like the Canadian model. Um, and that's why I moved from academia. And I can say it's a sea shift in, in Sweden. So the overall topic is, is uh, contributions. And we have sort of touched upon scientific method. I think you were the first to mention it. And uh, Christian, you also mentioned scientific method or making things generalizable, making them work in many places. And I think uh, this is really hard, even for uh, people who are doing their PhD. I think the scientific is, method is hard. And uh, if it's hard for us, uh, I, I certainly know that if you're reading, again, we've said that the papers are not intended to be read by, practi by practitioners, but when they do, the method section is what they, you know, if they get that far, that, that's really is a, uh, an obstacle to them. Um, when I'm making uh, papers or studies, I, I try to find good method, method papers that I try to follow. And I think um, also I try to do good evaluations. But here is uh, maybe, a, I don't really know what I'm saying, but I think this is really central to getting a contribution that can be used in, in more than my, you know, um, in my Tis study. Tom. Yeah. Tom? So one, one thing that we're talking about engineering, science, and so forth, and I guess we all agree we are all, we are supposedly software engineers. One of the characteristics of, a, of an engineering field is that there are well understood approaches, methods, techniques, that are more or less agreed on throughout the, throughout the field by all, by all good practitioners of that field. This seems to be something that is lacking, I think, in, if we look at software testing as an engineering field, uh, there seems to be not much agreement, right? I mean, there's been software testing research at least for 40 years, uh, maybe longer. And I guess maybe, peop maybe everyone agrees that, uh, that statement coverage is something that <laughs> that's usable. Okay, this, is, this was invented 45, 50 years ago. You know, has, what kind of progress has there been? What, what are the techniques and approaches that are generally agreed that are s sound engineering principles that would apply for software production? You know, is, there's lots of disagreement still, right? I mean, we, all these papers come all the time. 
and there's disagreement. Uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things I think are presented as uh, the first time something is being presented, and if you look back 10 years, the same thing was presented 10 years ago. Uh, so, okay, I'm, this is kind of a rambling s yes. sort of thing, we're, we're but are, are there, the could, could everyone just say, I mean, <clears throat> what do you feel are the real things? We don't solid have time things? for everyone. No, no, okay, okay so one minute we, each. What we feel are the real, <laughs> I didn't hear the end of your, your question. I'm sorry, what? I didn't hear the end of your question. The, okay, the question is simply, are there some agreed on sound principles that anyone who could calls themselves a software testing engineer would understand, would know, and understand, and apply. We don't, you don't have to be fancy with, with fancy stuff, just what are the basic things? The first I say is yes, there are, if you search for them. But I think the problem is that a lot of people that work with testing come into testing by accident. The testing field has exploded lately, and we've seen that the quality of the testers have not been what they should be because people have happened to end up in testing. Bob has a, hasn't got them to do, so let's put him on testing, or I'm a consultant, I want to make a quick buck, sort of. That we are getting away from now. So I'm hoping that in the next few years we see the quality increasing in it. So I think it's mostly ignorance, actually, to be honest. Okay, I hey. think we should finish. We're supposed to One last question here. I'm just trying to hear. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was. Um, my comment is that uh, this model that we try to have one-to-one -one collaboration between one university and one uh, company, it's not as scalable. I'm trying to do it as junior uh, academic, and it's a lot of overhead. We, um, so I think one other option would be create going towards something like a Kaggle, like something that you know other um, domains do. They Clearly, those who are interested in solving something, they put it up there. They also take some of this overhead. They put it somewhere, and then p other people, they, they can come and try to solve it. So a lot of current uh, collaboration between, research, uh, between academic and industry is just trying to get things up to the place that you just start to work as a research. A lot of that overhead can be easily fixed and resolved if there is a repository, there is a place that people from industry, they put the problem there and researchers try to exactly solve the relevant problem, right? So that relevancy is solved, but also the overhead is kind of broken down. Just a, a quick answer. I agree with you that there is a significant overhead. That's why relatively few people, researchers, do it on a regular basis or at an intensive level. Uh, but I think it's also the role of universities to make that type of research possible. Uh, in many universities, that type of collaborative research is not appreciated, and professors are not given the means to engage with industry. So that's the problem. But the solution you propose to put it out there, as you put it, in a repository, unfortunately, uh, has, uh, in my opinion, severe limitations. It's very hard to solve problems out of context without actually understanding the domain, uh, talking to engineers. So just putting artifact out there in a repository is going to be uh, of limited use, uh, in my opinion. Yeah. I okay, we have we to, have to wrap finish. Up. And first, we like to thank, of course, the panel, the audience.